You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 93, Interwar Air Power Part 2, Where do they expect us to go when the bombs fall? This week, a big thank you goes out to Gareth for choosing to support the podcast by becoming a member. Members get access to ad-free episodes and special member-only episodes roughly once a month. Member subscriptions are available on Apple Podcast subscriptions and Patreon, and you can head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. While air power in general was important to the overall course of the Second World War, There were many different facets of how air power was used in an attempt to achieve military objectives. One of the largest, in terms of resources and manpower, was the strategic bombing campaigns that would take place throughout the course of the war. The largest of these campaigns would be launched by the British and Americans against Germany and by the Americans against Japan. The destructive power of these campaigns was on a level never seen in previous conflicts. But there is still some continuing debate about their efficacy when it came to turning effort and resources into damage to the enemy's war effort. We will not get too much into those debates during this episode, and we will instead focus on the growth and evolution of strategic bombing and the assumptions made about what it would mean for the future of warfare during the interwar years. It would be during those years that the ability of aircraft to launch strategic bombing campaigns to strike at the very heart of the enemy, would begin to gather a vocal following who would argue that it would be the most important usage of air power during any future conflict. There were many reasons why strategic bombing took on such importance during these years. There were military reasons learned from the First World War, mostly around the recognition that it was no longer enough to defeat an enemy on the battlefield, and that it was also important to be able to strike at the enemy's industrial and economic foundations. There were economic reasons as well, with the desire to find literally any other possible avenue for development that could prevent another attritional-based conflict like the Great War. And it was also driven by fear. Fear that if you did not have strategic strike capabilities, the enemy would, and there would be nothing that you could do to stop them. Or to quote the quite famous quote from Stanley Baldwin, In the next war, you will find that any town within reach of an aerodrome can be bombed within the first five minutes of war to an extent inconceivable in the last war. I think it is well also for men in the street to realize that there is no power on earth that can protect him from being bombed. Whatever people may tell him, the bomber always gets through. Imagine 100 cubic miles covered with cloud and fog and you can calculate how many aeroplanes you would have to throw into that to have any chance of catching odd aeroplanes as they fly through. End quote. All the arguments in the support of strategic bombing, and all the fears that strategic bombing caused, were all based on one core foundational assumption, that bombing could, and most certainly would, be capable of greatly influencing the course of a war, and of causing significant and unavoidable damage to its intended targets. This core assumption was spooled out into many, many more assumptions about the damage that could be dealt with specific bombing payloads, of the effect that damage would have on the enemy war effort, the ability of fighters and anti-aircraft guns to interdict bombing raids, how many bombers were needed to have a decisive impact. The list goes on and on, 
or to quote strategic bombing the British, American, and German experiences by Williamson Murray, quote, perhaps the greatest problem that confronted airmen and innovators was the extent and range of assumptions they had to make in thinking about and preparing for strategic bombing, end quote. I think the most interesting thing about the preparations made for strategic bombing campaigns during the interwar years are these assumptions, not just of, of air forces about themselves and their capabilities, but also about their enemies. They're not just snapshots of a belief at a time, but they would also have crucial impacts on how nations planned and prepared their bomber fleets. They would be the assumptions, decisions, and beliefs of the 1920s and mid-1930s that would create the air forces that would meet in the air over Europe in the first two years of the Second World War. We will discuss some of these assumptions throughout this episode, which means uh, we should probably dive in. In the years immediately after the First World War, one of the most important theorists on air power and its role in future conflict was the Italian general Giulio Duhay. Even before the war, he had been a forward thinker, constantly suggesting changes and reforms that would allow the Italian army to have a greater chance of success. Now, for those who have not listened to History of the Great War, or are not up on their First World War history, the Italian army was not exactly known for its innovation or for its ability to adapt to problems that it faced. There were, after all, 11 battles of the Asanzo. 11. Eventually, Duhay, after a bit of a rocky relationship with the military during the war years, would retire in June 1918, at least partially due to his simple annoyance that nothing was really changing. Then after the war, it would take him just three years to publish The Command of the Air, his most famous work. Duhay's entire concept of a future war rested on the power of a strategic strike force that could take the war directly to the enemy. He was adamant that planes, bombs, and effort should not be wasted on supporting operations on the ground, or even on defensive efforts against enemy aircraft. Everything should be focused on a strategic offensive. He would even go so far as to call ground attack and pursuit, or what would later be called fighters, uh, auxiliary aviation units. Instead, he wanted complete focus on attacking an enemy nation and its vital industries in other areas behind the fighting line. To do this, Duhay believed that nations should focus strictly on building the largest, most modern, and most capable force of bombers that was possible. The only other type of aircraft that might be required was a really fast one with some cameras on it to do some recon work. Other than that, everything should be big, able to carry bombs, and have the range to carry them deep into enemy territory. This would allow them to attack an enemy and destroy that enemy's will to continue the conflict. To try and dive deeper into these various theories and beliefs, let's look at some quotes from The Command of the Air. Quote, War is a conflict between two wills basically opposed to one another. On one side is the party who wants to occupy a certain portion of the earth. On the other stands his adversary, the party who intends to oppose that occupation, if necessary by force of arms. The result is war. End quote. In attacking an enemy's will, the place to hit was not the front lines of the army. They were expecting to be attacked, and they would prepare defenses. Instead, the targets should be easier to locate, attack, and damage. Targets far from the focus of the fighting. Cities, factories, and homes were all quite easy to destroy, unlike trenches and pillboxes that were designed to withstand the explosive power of air-delivered bombs. Duhay would say, quote, We should always keep in mind that aerial offensives can be directed not only against objectives of least physical resistance, but against those of least moral resistance as well. For instance, an infantry regiment in a shattered trench may still be capable of some resistance even after losing two-thirds of its effectives. But when the working personnel of a factory sees one of its machine shops destroyed, even with a minimum loss of life, it quickly breaks up and the plant ceases to function. End quote. Once the bombing was complete, Duhay would argue that the end result was obvious and predictable. Quote, a complete breakdown of the social structure cannot but take place in a country subjected to this kind of merciless pounding from the air. The time would soon come when, to put an end to horror and suffering, the people themselves, driven by the instinct of self-preservation, would rise up and demand an end to the war. Now, to achieve all of these things, air power could not just exist. It had to be structured around achieving these objectives, 
air power had to be seen as a purely offensive weapon. He completely dismissed the idea that air power should be used in the defensive mode, and he would discuss what he believes were some of the reasons that it could not be useful at all in a defensive posture. Quote, an aerial force is a threat to all points within its radius of action, its units operating from their separate bases and converging in mass for the attack on the designated target faster than any other means so far known. For this reason, air power is a weapon superlatively adapted to offensive operations because it strikes suddenly and gives the enemy no time to parry the blow by calling up reinforcements. End quote. According to Duhay, any resources, time, and manpower spent on these defensive preparations was not just a waste of time, but actively harmful to achieving the end goal of projecting as much power as possible against the enemy. He was also a strong advocate for using all available tools in these bombing campaigns, not just high explosive bombs, but incendiary and poison gas as well. Duhay would point out that gas was a great way to prolong the effects of an air raid, as the gas would remain in the target area at lethal concentration levels far longer than explosives or even fires, which could be extinguished. Quote, gas attacks must be so planned as to leave the target permeated with gas, which will last over a long period of time, whole days indeed, a result which can be attained either by the quality of the gases used or by using bombs with varying delayed action fuses. End quote. Finally, and, and crucially, Duhay argued that even if one nation did not want to launch these kinds of attacks, if they did not want to bomb factories, drop incendiary bombs on civilian targets, drop poisonous gases in the middle of cities, that just meant they were going to lose the war, because their enemies might do all of those things, and there would be nothing that any nation could do to stop it, unless they were able to strike harder, better, faster, and stronger. With all that said, Duhay would make a lot of assumptions, obviously because he was trying to predict the future. A line-by-line refutation of Duhay's theories from the book, especially as they related to events that were 20 years after it was published, would be a bit tiresome. But I'll I'll reference one foundational mistake and then a few incorrect predictions Duhay would make that would reinforce his beliefs and directly contribute to his incorrect conclusions. In the mistake category, Duhay simply overestimates the physical damage that bombs can do to targets when he is suggesting what should be bombed. He tries to base his damage estimates on some math, including the exact destruction radius of a bomb, how much explosives, you know, bombs should have in them, and indeed how many should be dropped. And all of these calculations were very, very optimistic. This mistake causes him to believe that bombers would have a much greater impact relative to their bomb-carrying capacity than they actually would during the Second World War. This is because math kind of compounds upon itself, so when you make a small calculation error for each bomb, and you're talking about dropping hundreds or thousands, that small mathematical error can get multiplied hundreds or, or thousands of times. Now, in the bad prediction category, Duhay really overestimates the psychological effect that bombing will have on a civilian population. Duhay believes that relatively small attacks and the damage that they cause over a short period of time would be enough to prompt full-on revolution and revolt by the people. If anything, the events of the Second World War would prove that the effects of bombing attacks would often be the exact opposite, with many civilians in cities that were bombed simply hardening their resolve and determination even when far greater amounts of bombs were dropped over a far longer period of time. The second bad prediction, and one that I I don't think is something that warrants too much criticism, is that Duhay was unable to predict the vast advancements that would be made in the realm of aerial defense. Radar, faster fighters, and other technological advancements would remove many of the limitations that Duhay believed made the defender's task impossible. But this mistake also ties back to the first two items that we discussed, because Duhay believed that a hard-hitting aerial campaign could end wars quickly, before whatever defenses that could be mounted, and which could have a limited success rate, could chip away at the ability of the bombers to have their decisive impact. At the end of the day, honestly, Duhay was a, a zealot, with all the negative parts of that word included. He so strongly believed in his views on strategic bombing, views that would only grow in intensity later in life, that he was incapable of properly considering everything that might go wrong for a force of strategic bombers, or the things that might change that would make his views incorrect. 
But during the interwar years, Duhay would be an important writer on the topic, although there would also be others in other nations. There were shared ideas between many of them, and they all built on one another, creating a narrative around how a future war would be shaped by the unstoppable power of strategic bombing. Narratives that would influence the technical designs of aircraft and strategic planning of nations during the 1920s and 30s. It may sound dull, maybe even monotonous, but this is what miracles sound like. This is the sound of a child's surgery being performed by a robot. Our personalized care leads to miraculous things. Like innovative procedures with less pain and faster recovery. Children's Hospital Colorado. Here, it's different. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. While the development of strategic bombing concepts and capabilities was led by military leaders and theorists like Duhay, it was also one topic that was well publicized and had a distinct public component to the discussions during the interwar years. A key part of that public concern and discourse was the well known fact that strategic bombing was a direct threat to civilian lives. We do not have the type of hyper accurate public polling that we have in the modern day. But when we look at secondhand sources like newspaper articles, we see a good amount of discussion about strategic bombing and the threat that it posed to civilians. One of the ideas that became quite popular was that the next war would start with massive aerial raids that would cause massive damage and might even result in the end of the war just days or weeks after it started. This theory was known as the knockout blow theory and it was very prevalent in some nations, particularly in Britain during the 1920s and 1930s. It would also enjoy a good amount of political backing as well, and these concerns and, and that political support would be bolstered by air power advocates who saw it as an easy path towards additional funding and resources. Advocating for these resources was pretty important in a lot of military areas that were highly resource-constrained in the 1920s, and then there was a very competitive rearmament atmosphere in the 1930s, when in each nation, all military disciplines kind of jockeyed for a limited pool of resources. The idea of the knockout blow was very difficult to challenge directly, and those who did not agree that it would happen did not necessarily have a great reason to say that it would not be the case. Just as the knockout blow advocates were basing their predictions on a lot of conjecture and assumptions, those who pushed back against the concept had little other than the same types of conjecture and assumptions. All of these fears would be very acute in Britain, where the threat of a land invasion was always much lower than any other area of continental Europe. This meant that the only way in which many Britons felt that they were under a direct threat was from the air, giving conversations about air raids and the damage that they could cause a much greater importance. Now, not every concern was rooted in illogical fear. There were also some real technical challenges that seemed insolvable. For example, bomber interception was a real problem. Until just a few years before the start of the war, there was little that could be done to stop bombers from reaching their targets and dropping their bombs. Radar did not yet exist, and the speed and rate of climb of fighter aircraft in the 1920s and early 1930s meant that intercepting bombers would be a real challenge. 
the math between altitude, climb rate, and speed just did not work out in favor of the interceptors, and while it would be possible to get early warning of bombing raids at times through manual processes like human lookouts and spotters, these types of systems were very brittle and porous. This resulted in conversations about the concerns of being bombed devolving into a discussion not just about defensive operations, but how to offensively strike at the enemy. And just as Duhay had predicted, the only option appeared to be to drop more bombs on the enemy before they could launch their own raids. And when discussing offensive bombing operations, which seemed to be critical, the question of targets would eventually have to be discussed. At the most gruesome, and I would honestly probably say the most honest, was this quote from Stanley Baldwin. Quote, the only defense is in offense, which means we have got to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you want to save yourself. End quote. That quote was in the context of Baldwin pushing for greater disarmament efforts in the early 1930s, and he used that quote as an example of why disarmament was so important. It was perhaps an exaggeration and a simplification of the military objectives of strategic bombing, but as would be proven during the Second World War, I'm not sure it was necessarily incorrect. There were many and serious conversations about what targets should and should not be prioritized, given the limited number of bombers that each nation would have available in time of war. For example, the conversations and the resulting doctrine around AP 1300, which was the Royal Air Force War Manual that was published in July 1928. I will give a quote from Trenchard and Morale Bombing, The Evolution of the Royal Air Force Before World War II by Philip S. Meliger, who does a good job of summarizing and analyzing some of the contents of the manual. Meliger would say it would include a summary concerning how bombing objectives should be chosen. Quote, the choice of bombing objectives was dependent on five factors the nature of the war and the enemy, the general war plan of the government, diplomatic considerations, the range of the bombers, and the strength of enemy air defenses. As a general rule, the manual opined that objectives should be selected, the bombardment of which will have the greatest effect in weakening the enemy resistance and his power to continue war. End quote. The interesting thing about AP 1300 is that it did contain references to how important it was to break the enemy's morale and even directly to break civilian morale. But it never directly discussed bombing raids that would target civilian targets, causing civilian damage, suffering, and death. There was a distinction made between normal civilians and workers, especially munitions workers, but there was some hesitancy to formally and fully endorse the indiscriminate bombing of targets, especially cities or purely civilian targets. In Britain during these conversations, some would even argue that no matter what was happening to civilian targets, no matter how much you targeted them, it would still result in less overall suffering and brutality than another war like what had happened between 1914 and 1918. That's not because bombing civilian targets would not cause civilian suffering, just that it would cause less suffering than other options. Or to quote Hugh Trenchard, leader of the RAF in 1928, quote, I emphatically do not advocate indiscriminate bombing, and I think that air action will be less indiscriminate and far less brutal, and will obtain its end with far fewer casualties than either naval blockade, a naval bombardment, or sieges, or when military formations are hurled against the enemy's strongest points protected by barbed wire and covered by mass artillery and machine guns. End quote. What ends up happening during the war uh, around this conversation and the bombing of civilian cities in area bombing campaigns, or or the Blitz, or the firebombing of Dresden, or the atomic bombs on Japan, and other such events, are conversations that we will have on the podcast eventually. But what I will say now is that for interwar military leaders in nations like Britain, there was a difference between decisions that might be made in time of war and planning to do those things during peacetime. During the Second World War, decisions were made within the confines of a conflict that had already seen civilian bombing from both sides, massive civilian suffering for other reasons as well, and so many other atrocities throughout the conflict. But to plan to do that bombing, to make it clear in peacetime that the goal of the Royal Air Force's strategic bombing squadrons was to kill enough civilians to end the war, that was something that was maybe better left unsaid. 
And then, of course, when the war does start, something really interesting happens. Every Air Force suddenly realizes that actually achieving real objectives through a bombing campaign that targets civilian morale is incredibly difficult. The ability of civilians to continue to support the war effort is something that far exceeds the ability of strategic bombers to destroy. Uh, One of the major lessons in general about strategic bombing that made many pre-war predictions incorrect was simply how many munitions would need to be delivered on targets to have the expected impact on a nation's war-making capabilities. It would be a, a staggering amount, which made the fears about the capabilities of strategic bombing both completely unfounded and prophetic at the same time. At the beginning of the war, they were completely unfounded because nobody had enough bombers to deliver the early knockout blow that was so prevalent in interwar writings. But then by the end of the war, bombers were capable of dropping nuclear bombs that would flatten entire cities. And for the first time, a nation possessed the kind of knockout blow capabilities that had driven those interwar fears. So that fear would end up being legitimate. Nuclear bombing is something to be afraid of. But it was just a bit too early to be concerned about the capabilities of the strategic bombings of other nations in the 1930s. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we begin something of a tour around Europe and the world to look at the air forces around the world to talk about some of the decisions that they made in the run-up to the Second World War.